one-eyed Joe. There was, however, one place where horror still lurked. The cheap and vengeful melodramas of Todd Slaughter. He is so off the scale as regards melodramatic acting is concerned. The old cliche of the, the character that twir twirls his moustache, well, well, that's Todd Slaughter for you. They are full of seduced milkmaids and bodies being strangled and then left in cellars. I think my favourite Todd Slaughter moment is the beginning of Crimes at the Dark House. He drives a tent peg through his best friend's head in order to steal his inheritance. <laughs> and laughs while he's doing it. Nobody committed more crimes in one film than, than Todd Slaughter. Todd was 50 by the time he came to the movies, but for years he'd been touring in stage versions of old barnstormers like Murder in the Red Barn. And his type was cast. Upstanding squire or solicitor by day, spine-breaking poisoning garotta by night. His fans called him Mr. Murder. On behalf of the servants, may I extend you a cordial welcome, Sir Percival? You may, my man. There was something uniquely British about him. Rather like boiled beef and carrots gone rancid. He was a rather strange, frog-like face with a shark's grin and jug ears. Those movies are actually much more gruesome than the Hollywood pictures. Percival, you're hurting me! So you wanted to be a bride, my dear Jessica, did you? So you shall be a bride of death. <laughs> Maybe because they're cheap, they're made outside even the mainstream of the British film industry. Playing to the, you know, the, the lowest common denominator. Is the soap to your liking? Most delicately perfumed. And the water hot enough? Perfect. And we'll see if my razor will suit you. Tobias? George Dibden Pitt's Sweeney Todd from the mid-19th century is perhaps the most famous of Slaughter's, um, adaptations. <laughs> if ever a man was born to a role, this was it. <laughs> He's just an extraordinary figure. <laughs> Completely theatrical cackle. <laughs> He just goes, care for a shave, huh? I can't wait to polish you off. <laughs> After the war, Slaughter's film career went into decline, but he carried on cackling for any stage audience who would have him. It's murder! No, not murder. Just Slaughter. Todd Slaughter. <laughs> In 1956, after yet another night of strangling and laughing, Todd dropped dead in his dressing room. Horror, however, was in good hands. She's seen the curse of Frankenstein! In the same year, Hammer did what Todd would have loved to do. Killed people in horrible ways in colour. The X certificate had been the making of Hammer, and when the public had had enough sci-fi, the company came up with a story that was violent, shocking, and well out of copyright. Early horror histories would always refer to the Hammer films as remakes of the Universal films. Totally wrong. Oh, is generally the first to go? It's total reinventions, reimaginings, rethinkings, which is what makes them so powerful to this day. Hammer House director Terence Fisher shot in glorious Eastman colour to create a film which in a world of nostalgic war movies and hospital-based rom-coms was nothing short of revolutionary. Suddenly to have this very vivid, dark fairy tale, it must have had an extraordinary effect on audiences at that time who were used to everything being a bit conservative and staid and colourless. It was the music, it was the mood. As a child watching it, it was very kind of primal, the, the fear that it brought up in you. Universal's Frankenstein was all about the monster, but Hammer's script turned his creator into the star. Peter Cushing was the ideal casting for a newly promoted script editor called Jimmy Sangster. He was a very good actor, and he could make even the rubbishy lines I wrote him sound important. 
I gave him life. I put a brain in his head. But I chose a good brain, a brilliant one. It was you who damaged it. Cushing redefined Frankenstein, obviously along with the screenwriter Jimmy Zangster, as a sort of Faustian, Byronic overreacher, complete monomaniac. The film also brought another great British horror career to horrible life when Christopher Lee was cast as the mummified monster, a small part for a very big man. Christopher Lee got the job because Bernard Breslau's agent wanted too much money. And he was the only other actor that tall. Lee, looking nothing like a product of the rank charm school, made a great monster. To this day, I don't think Christopher Lee's creature has been properly evaluated. It's a marvellous mime performance. He actually decided to play the creature as a brain-damaged child, and that's very visible in his performance. Never had a costume film so perfectly suited the pulse of its time. Frankenstein was shot just after Look Back in Anger caused a sensation at London's Royal Court Theatre. Times were changing, and Hammer were ahead of them. The Curse of Frankenstein has a flavour of that angry young man quality, kind of bitterness. It's one of Hammer's most unpleasant films. It's an ugly film. They were gory. They shot Chris Lee in the face when he's the monster, and he comes up rah, with all this groove. There was a graphic quality to it that was totally uncalled for. And I'll never forget the audience's reaction to that midnight showing at the New York Paramount. It was, they loved it. Hammer had discovered an appetite for horror amongst the one section of the cinema audience that was still growing, teenagers. And soon other studios began looking enviously at their success. On the very same day that filming had begun on Frankenstein, an adaptation of an M.R. James ghost story got underway at Elstree. The film was to be called Night of the Demon. Since the beginning of time, evil, supernatural creatures exist in a world of darkness. It's much rarer to see ghost stories on film. Whereas horror is usually a show and tell exercise, it's very rare that you find a film that actually manages to make it frightening without showing too much. Since the early days, either fear of the censor or fear of the special effects bill meant that few films had taken ghost stories seriously. This one did. Ah, why did you drop the poker? Red hot. Didn't you know? Boy, you're as pale as death. There was something in here. Night of the Demon was quintessentially English. The principal character is a skeptic, and the film relates how, bit by bit, he comes to actually believe that he will die. Night of the Demon was followed by Night of the Eagle. And that, if possible, was even scarier. It was sheer, naked fear. I remember being so scared that I thought I was going to die and that the, the lights would come up and the usherette would discover my corpse. But the film of this period that's hardest to forget is a haunted house movie that's thick with terror, sex and Deborah Carr. The Innocence is ours, though it was financed by Fox and based on a Henry James novella. It's about two orphans, a governess to look after them in this very, very big house. And at first, of course, they seem to be beautiful and innocent and very, very sweet. But gradually the governess begins to find out that there may be something more sinister going on. I love this house. Don't you, Miss Giddens? It's very beautiful and so large. Where you used to live, was that a big house too? No, it was very small, I'm afraid. How small? Very, very small. Too small for you to have secrets? 
starring Pamela Franklin as Flora, Martin Stevens as Miles, and Ms. Carr as their unhinged governess. The film is perhaps the most Freudian ghost movie ever. All right, you hide and I'll seek. We can go all over the house, can't we? Everywhere, I mean. Yes, I should think so. The Innocence works as a psychological study of sort of suppressed hysteria, but it also works brilliantly as a straight ghost story. I'm not a believer that things are necessarily scarier if you don't show them. All I think is if you do show them, they'd better be scarier than my own imagination. Cameraman Freddie Francis used special filters to create an atmosphere of unease. She's out walking and there's a kind of heavy summer drone and it just goes silent. And it, it really, it sort of puts you in the picture of what it might be like if you ever felt there was a... Like all good ghost stories, no one else sees them. She's so repressed sexually, you wonder throughout whether the governess is just sort of a, a neurotic spinster who's making this up. I'll show you! It can't be! It can't be! Is all this in her mind or not? Peter Quint, the master's valet. But you see... Yes, miss, you see, he's dead. Quint is dead. <sighs> Martin Stevens had already weirded out British audiences as a peroxided alien schoolboy with light bulbs in his eyes in the sci-fi drama Village of the Damned. When he played Miles, he did it again, without the help of special effects. Martin Stevens is electrifying. He gets the whole idea of, is this child possessed by a more mature, rather corrupt man? Because it's just there in his eyes. Miles! He is really creepy as this child who knows more than he lets on. But you're not 100% sure, and there is definitely something up with those children. Are you cross? Yes, I am. I thought you would be. Come on, I'll tell you when I'm in bed. I wanted you to think me bad for a change. For a change? So I thought, why not go out tonight and wander about in my bare feet? These were demanding roles as an 11-year-old boy. I couldn't understand the, the sort of deep sexual nature of this. Miles, tell me the truth. I am. There is one scene when he's being put to bed by the governess, and he says to her, Kiss me goodnight, Miss Giddens. I kiss her full on the lips, and not just like a little peck. It's a long lover's kiss. But what is really creepy about it is not only is it shocking to the governess, but you feel she has actually also quite enjoyed it. The Innocence was released just as the trend for kitchen sink dramas was taking off. Director Jack Clayton's previous big success was The Steamy Room at the Top, starring Lawrence Harvey as a scheming sexual predator. Sexual predators were big in the early 60s, but the daddy of all these cinematic dandies came from the world of horror, and he wasn't at all common. Not a bit of it. Chris's Dracula was so powerful. He had the greatest entrance. He just walked down the stairs. <laughs> 